Yes, hi Nesrin. Uh, also waiting for Kathy and Luis to turn on their cameras just to see that we are all here and everything it's going fine and then we can already start with everything. Hi team. And we are just meeting Kathy, if you could please uh, turn on your camera and Luis as well. Yeah, I've already turned it on. Ah. It's looking for my camera. I hope it, um, it can manage to look for my camera. It's a built-in camera. Mm, maybe you just need to turn on to press on the acceptance. Ah, uh, so it's, I, have to allow, I have to allow it. Um, yeah. yeah, it's there. There you go. Thanks, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then if you can turn the mic on. Then... Yes. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here. There are a lot of people, and we are very excited for this lot. So I am just going to be very brief with the presentation uh, of this lot. So the idea of having an anti-colonial slot is to discuss about the tools, perspectives, and actions with an anti-colonial perspective that are happening and taking place here in Germany in order to see how they can complement each other, uh, create positive synergies, and also to discuss which is the role that we can play here in Germany in this anti-colonial struggles and in the anti-colonial uh, and against the colonial dynamics that are happening in the world. So uh, we see recently that there is a lot of potential with this, uh, with the struggles, for example, uh, with the calls to mobilize against um, the oil exploitation in the Atlantic that happened a couple of weeks ago uh, because of what was happening in Argentina and the oil spillage in Ecuador last year with the ECB campaigns. So there are a lot of campaigns going on and there are a lot of uh, will to mobilize uh, regarding these different structures. So um, the idea behind this is to see how can we build on that thing that it's out there. Uh, yes, sorry, there is also translation, so I need to speak a bit slower. Um, so the idea is to see how what's out there and how we can create uh, a wider and larger anti-colonial mobilizations, how we can create narratives that make visible these colonial dynamics, see who's benefiting from this, see who mobilizes from this, have more people include these perspectives in their narratives and in their actions, um, because uh, in order we need this strength in order to mobilize and change those colonial dynamics. And this is very important because, as we know, colonialism is a pillar of the capitalistic system. So therefore, anti-colonialism is a must if we want to change it. So today we're going to have four different presentations of different organized struggles that are happening here in Germany. Um, we'll have Kathy from Alpas, Filipinas. Uh, we'll have Luis from Endegelende, Tina from 350.org, and Nesrina from Africa Europe Interact. So um, just to start, we'll start with Kathy from Alpas, Filipinas, uh, and the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to um, check if everybody can hear me clearly. Thank you so much, Santi, for um, that session. So first, I would like to thank everyone and also Vlutna in this very Sunny Sunday, at least here in Potsdam, <laughs> and we are we are all here seated and to listen to a very important discussion. I think it already shows how committed we are to kind of sit here and not go outside. Anyway, um, again, thank you so much for the organizers for giving us a space to be here today. And as Santa said, I'm, I'm from Alpas, Filipinas. I also represent here the organization Gabriela Germany. It's a women, Filipino women's collective that is active in the Philippines as well as here in, in Germany. And um, I think for my presentation, I would like to first start with what do we really um, stand for or how do we actually see climate imperialism and the struggle for climate justice before I can 
share live stream what we are actually do to mobilize and to organize people, not only Filipinos, but also other um, people from different collectives in um, the spirit of solidarity. So <clears throat> our call is to uh, a collective call to end uh, climate imperialism. Our political leaders, especially from the high polluting countries, well, that includes Germany, USA, Australia, you know them, are climate imperialists. They prioritize profit over the planet sorry, and people. Yeah, sorry? I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but there's um, the suggestion that you move the microphone a little bit away from your mouth. Ah, okay. Because the sound, the sound is not as clear. Okay, how about this one? Is it better? Here? Hello? Sorry, I don't... I right, don't. Just try again, we'll see. Thank you. Sure, okay. Our um, call is a collective call to end climate imperialism. So we see that our political leaders, is it better? Just give me a sign. They're here. Okay. Um, especially from the high polluting countries, are climate imperialists. And um, we have predicted, for example, even Naomi Klein have predicted that in the absence of a post Paris plan, we can never solve the climate crisis. This is voices outside the negotiating table. Who speaks for the climate change or climate negotiations during these events? It's always the arrogant voices of political leaders and business lobbyists concerned more about the development and economic growth. The existing representational imbalance within the climate negotiations often lead to the failure of climate targets. Our hope is, of course, beyond negotiating framework of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCC. Um, we align ourselves with some of the most critical analysis and the most critical voices, including um, Professor Jose Maria Sison, if you haven't heard about him. He was the chairperson of the International League of People's Struggles and also the chief political consultant of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. And I would like to quote him. He said, it would take a further development of capitalism to its monopoly stage which we call it imperialism, that science and technology would be used by the monopoly capitalist class to plunder, pollute, and ruin the environment to the extent of posing the danger of human extinction. We are now confronted with the problem of huge amounts of carbon dioxide emissions that are causing unprecedented global warming and catastrophic effects. So, our main question is, where is the accountability of climate commitment? Um, Kathy, can you maybe disconnect this uh, microphone and do it with the... Uh, this one? No? I think that I can hear you better with this one. It's better for everyone. I'm really so sorry. Um, how about this one? I'm talking, can you hear me? Much better. Okay, perfect. I hope uh, we did not log some of the things that I have said. Shall I start from the beginning? Anyway, I will just go on and then later on in the discussion perhaps we could um, enrich our discussion with some of the points that you might be interested to know. So, as I, as, as what I'm saying is that where do we actually look into who, who's, uh, who's accountable when it comes to the climate commitment and, of course, in the struggle for climate justice, especially representing those countries like my country and other southern countries who are actually mostly affected by the adverse effect of the climate change. So, climate finance, loss and damage, and carbon market rules are the key areas that should be safeguarded. And most likely, without the participation of people's organizations, often the implementations and mechanisms are left upon the incapacities of political leaders. And we want to highlight that. They are very incapacitated because their influence is very much in contradiction to the interests of the people on the ground. Only to find out that most of the countries fail to deliver their ambitious national climate targets. We have seen through the climate adaptations and mitigations of many countries in the past and the failure to cascade the ecological commitments of every nation. 
and massive uncontrolled developments have continued to rapidly impact the construction of the planet. It's the multi-billion climate finance fund downloaded into the core solutions of the climate crisis. Germany alone contributed 5.1 billion euros in 2020, and Germany is still dependent on coal and into pipeline projects, and yet solutions are still dim. So what do we actually demand? We demand justice for the deaths it's primarily for the deaths of environmental defenders. And it's, of course, this is also not related to the Philippines. We have seen even many South American countries, Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, um, Argentina, all these countries suffer from the fascist attacks of their governments just because they want to defend their lands, just because they want to protect the environment, not only for them, but only for the future generation. So here we say that there is a level of future condemnation for the many UNFCCC conference of parties movements on the death of climate defenders. They're always talking about solutions, greenwashing, etc. on the table, but they never talk about what's really happening in the ground, which is a bloody massacre for the environmental defenders. In the year 2020, according to the report of the Global Witness, I'm sure you also know all of these websites that monitor and the attacks happening against environmental defenders, yeah, especially um, in the countries in the south, there were 227 murdered. Land and environmental defenders recorded globally. There were 29 persons murdered by the state forces in the Philippines. Among them, um, Sara Alvarez. Sara Alvarez came here in Berlin 2019 to join the first ever anti-colonial month. Uh, I'm sorry, that was 2019. And she was, she was killed a year after. We also have Joey Porquilla, he's a land rights defender in the Visayas region, and also nine indigenous peoples, we call them the Tuwanbok, they were killed brutally, and further seven arrested in raids by the military and police on the 30th of December in other parts of the country. And just Yesterday, I heard that one of the volunteer teachers of the indigenous peoples in the Philippines was murdered along with other five um, fellow um, teachers and volunteers. So this is something that's not being taken into consideration when we talk about climate um, solutions and all those developmental projects that they might want to do in order to solve this problem. It's very bloody out there, especially in the South. And just to continue, numerous reports state that these communities were targeted, take note, they were targeted for the opposition to the mega dam project, to a big mining company, to a big aggressive development projects. Just a few days ago, as I said, he's Chad Ball. He was a very strong human rights defender. He was a graduate of computer science and of one of the most prestigious universities in the Philippines. Come around at that. He just wanted to align himself in defending the rights of the indigenous peoples in the country, but he was totally murdered. We are experiencing ecological injustice every day. Our failure to connect climate emergency with the deaths of land defenders and indigenous leaders is a mark of indifference in the care for creation. Our climate advocacy must include the call for justice and our murdered activists. So climate imperialism overshadows the importance of the lives of the human defenders, sacrificing their lives for protecting nature and communities. These countries are only trying to see the trending data of CO2 emissions and the false solutions of mitigations and adaptations, which only emboldens the power of capitalist players to find alternatives of their economic pursuits at the expense of what? At the expense of the people and the planet. So just to end, um, I would like to leave this message that we have to end the irony of climate commitments. As there will be increasing climate commitments from UN Climate Change Conferences, there will also be increasing climate victims in the coming years. Where is the dissonance coming from? 
We can hear that from the cacophony of his pictures of world leaders or representatives of governments to a fucking green. But on the ground, mining companies continue to destroy indigenous communities. Coal plants have been approved, improved, widened, and built. Continued assassinations of environmental defenders, harassment of indigenous leaders, even people who align themselves to these struggles, struggles are being targeted. Um, my example being Sarah Alvarez. All are icing on the cake. We cannot eat the empty words. At the end of the day, the people and the planet suffer. Now is the time to continue marching on the streets. It is also one of those strategies that we have that we no longer trust the parliamentary that is built by the power structures that, that, the, the, um, that are existing, but we want to claim the parliamentary that is open for everyone, which is the parliamentary of these streets. And we demand to end the climate imperialism. I think it's very good to, to call it how it's called, how it should be called, it's climate imperialism. And most of the people who will suffer from this um, new imperialist uh, plunder are those people who live in the countries that are very rich with natural resources. So again, we, uh, we echo the message as well of um, South American uh, Chico Mendez that for us, we see the climate justice, the fight for climate justice, is not just about looking into those solutions that these corporations, these climate imperialists, are putting on the table, but to really look for alternatives. And these alternatives are something that has to be taken from the grassroots and taken from the wisdom of protecting the environment, not only for the present, but for the future. And we say, environmentalism without class struggle is just gardening and i hope i did that over time i think it was yeah eight minutes i would very very happy to answer queries and the questions because i would also like to share how we actually do how do we um, implement all these stands all these stands that we have on the ground how do we actually connect with people not only here but also have the very um, strong connection with the people in the Philippines to amplify whatever struggle they have and also this idea that being an environmentalist is also aligning ourselves with the people in the ground who are mostly affected. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty, very much. I'm just going to quickly uh, do a short uh, summary because of the beginning with the problems. Uh, so your input was really important, Kathy. I think that uh, talking about climate imperialism and how uh, government and people are putting their uh, the profits before people, uh, it's something that it's happening uh, in a lot of countries in the global south, and it's something very important to bring to the table and also to connect this on how people are being killed just because they are asking for the right to defend what's theirs in their land uh, so that we need to uh, echo those uh, those struggles and we need to echo those demands uh, when we organize in order to be able to call for real climate justice and also to end climate uh, imperialism and to denounce this economic pursuit uh, which sorry I, i'm going to link it with some debates that are going on in different countries in the global south where whether it is uh extractivism uh, and development or um or poverty and backwardness and those are the things that government are pursuing and that is the way that they are uh, also um um uh, criminalizing uh, climate struggles and yeah as you mentioned also the case of sara alvarez that she was a participant in the first anti-colonial month that happened here in berlin and shortly after she participated there she was killed back in the philippines uh so having to echo this messages uh it's very important and also as cassie said later uh maybe after the breakout rooms we can talk about how um how this needs to be a grassroots movement and how from the grassroots we need to create alternatives uh to this system in order to end uh climate imperialism in the streets by organizing ourselves 
So relating to this uh, and about climate finances and following the uh, and knowing about how finances and neocolonialism works, uh, we will follow with Tina from 350 or Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy, for your words and um, the inspiration and thanks you for having me. Um, <clears throat> so I think there is going to be a presentation. Let me see if it works. Yes. And I also hope the sound is good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we are trying to build a movement that rises to end fossil finance. Um, this year we are going to focus on <clears throat> the Deutsche Bank and uh, call on them to defund climate chaos. And um, this is a nice picture from um, a protest back in October um, that asked a lot of banks in uh, Germany to stop funding fossil fuels. This has been in Frankfurt. And uh, who is we? So I'm a part of the organization 350.org. We are an international nonprofit organization and um, just to explain, 350 comes from parts per million in the atmosphere. You all know we are over 410 parts per million uh, today. And um, we, as an organization, we primarily fight against the coal, oil and gas industry. And we try to yeah, really empower a lot of people to join the climate movement with our campaigns. Um, I will tell you about the finance campaign today. We also have a fossil free campaign. It's a global divestment campaign targeting institutions like universities, churches or cities to stop investing in coal, oil and gas. And we are also developing campaigns uh, for just transition and for a good life for all. Um, yeah, and we are really uh, being part of a global movement to end fossil finance. Um, one reason why we decided to go after um, central banks, uh, but also a lot of private banks financing fossil fuels is also because our colleagues in Asia uh, said they can, they can build their resistance against, against fossil fuels, but it's going to be really hard if the finance still comes from Japan or Europe or North America and uh, funds um, in the billions uh, those uh, destructive projects. Um, so why Deutsche Bank? <clears throat> it's actually a really good target. Um, Deutsche Bank is the biggest uh, private bank in, um, in Germany and just has so many ties to different fossil fuel projects around the world. This is what the extraction often looks like. It's a very destructive business for people and the land. But it also looks shiny and sparkly like these uh, skyscrapers from banks who are financing um, uh, the destruction where people make decisions that are not affected at all by their decisions. They sit far away um, in their offices and um, yeah. Uh, with their decisions, they bring uh, destruction and climate catastrophe over communities around the world. <clears throat> so we are starting to see that the movement is really gearing up and that uh, different actors are also um, taking on uh, fossil finance. Uh, for example, um, uh, the global climate strike in September last year was focusing on fossil finance. Then we had a global day of action called Defund Climate Chaos. <clears throat> also a lot of protests around the climate conference in Glasgow in November happened around fossil finance. Um, for example, together with our colleagues from um, the Pacific Islands. And now uh, 2022, we are really building up our, um, our yeah, capacity um, in Germany to target uh, Deutsche Bank. So what does this have to do with colonialism? Um, well, the financial structures often reveal um, how colonialism used to work and now um, the neocolonialism is really visible in what is being financed. Um, yeah, uh, you might all know that, um, yeah, the, the face of colonialism uh, and, and the cost of colonialism, the genocide, uh, the concentration camps, 
the enslavement of people, the domination and um, devaluation of people and their ways of life and, and culture and also local language. Um, and at the same time, a devaluation of nature. So nature was also just perceived as a commodity, whereas often the communities uh, who lived there saw themselves as part of nature. <clears throat> So colonialism and capitalism are really at the heart of the climate crisis. They are uh, the cause of the climate crisis. And this is really important to know to also inform our campaigns. Without the exploitation of people and nature in the colonies, industrialization and also economic growth as we see it today would not have been possible. Without industrialization, the massive combustion of coal, oil, coal, oil and natural gas would also not have been possible. So um, it's really important to, to know your enemy and therefore also know your allies. Kathy also said we need to um, form strong uh, alliances with people on the ground in the global south who are the most affected. Um, um, and yeah, this is also seen in the climate injustice that you all know um, between um, the countries in the north and the south. So what does this mean for our campaigns? Um, climate protection must not happen at the expense of the global south. There are a lot of policies um, that are still perpetuating uh, colonial structures, neo-colonial structures. Um, one easy example is, for example, the um, uh, electric cars. So uh, if this is our only solution um, to the mobility crisis and the climate crisis, um, yeah, we see that entire landscapes in Bolivia are being destroyed for lithium mining. And in Congo, children mine variable cobalt. They lose their childhood, they, they lose their health. Um, and the water that is needed is not longer no longer available for <clears throat> the people and the agriculture. So we really need to see what kind of solutions we promote as a movement and how it can be a just solution, not only for us privileged people in the north, but for all people around the world. Um, and this also calls for us to take on the demand from a lot of people from the global south um, for compensatory payments like reparations and uh, good finance for loss and damage for communities in the global south. <clears throat> so the Deutsche Bank is really bring, bringing the exploitation and environmental degradation again to um, former colonies, colonies that have resisted colonialism, that have freed themselves. Um, uh, but with their finance, they are um, still bringing the destruction. <clears throat> and uh, I will not show you this now for time, but uh, maybe once the um, once the um, the panel has closed and you will uh, receive the material, this is a really nice video uh, from local resistance in um, in East Africa against the um, a crude oil pipeline in Africa that is going to be built. We hope it's not going to happen. Um, so the resistance uh, is building up. Uh, this is just one example of a neo-colonial fossil project that Deutsche Bank um, is considering to finance. <clears throat> A lot of banks have already said they will not finance it, and our goal is that uh, Deutsche Bank will drop IACOP as well. Um, you can see local resistance in different uh, African countries in this um, in this picture. The um, IACOP pipeline is mainly going to affect Uganda and Tanzania, but there's also been resistance in South Africa, for example. And this is also just to highlight that the communities in, um, in former colonized countries, they have fought this exploitation and destructions for centuries and decades, and they are still doing that. So it's our task to also get in touch with them and um, see how we can support their fights. Um, for us as 350, it's a little bit easier um, because we have colleagues around the world who are part of the resistance. 
um, and who can also guide us what is needed most. Um, one fight that 350 is also supporting a lot is the fight against fracking in Vaca Muerta, Argentina. Uh, you can see pictures of the resistance and also of, um, yeah, of the environmental destruction and the, the fires that are uh, caused by, um, by fracking. Yeah, and another example of fossil financing by Deutsche Bank is very close to home. It's coal mining in the Rhineland. Um, it's not obviously not uh, a neo-colonial uh, project, but it shows uh, that that we are all connected and um, that the exploitation is also still taking place here. And this is a really nice quote um, by Imi Ituen and Rebecca Abena Kennedy Asante from an article they wrote about um, the climate movement and um, colonialism. In order to understand the climate crisis and to counteract it, it is essential to make the link between different forms of oppression visible. So, um, yeah, this is, I guess, a call for the whole climate movement to think about who their allies might be, what their strategies are, and also what demands they are calling for. Thank you so much. And if any of you are interested to join the Deutsche Bank team or uh, the um, yeah, end fossil finance team in Germany, please get in touch. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tina, uh, for a wonderful presentation. And then, uh, so now we will move with Nesrina from Africa Europe Interact. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Santi. Thank you, Kathy and Tina for the amazing inputs. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, so to present uh, Africa Europe Interact briefly, it's a transnational network that was founded uh, at the end of 2009 in preparation of the Caravan for Freedom of Movement and Just Development. It was launched uh, on the initiative of the Association of Malian Deportees and they marched up until Senegal in Dakar. Um, to the uh, social, the World Social Forum. Um, so, um, and it involves grassroots activists, especially in Mali, but also in Togo, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Tunisia, Morocco, Germany, Austria, and, ne and the Netherlands. And this network has been also consolidating. It's been over 10 years that it's been around and um, it has been growing in many struggles. Um, it has a lot of territories involved. So also you have different facets of certain struggles. And this is how we learn also within the network. Um, the starting point of our collective is the anti-colonial umbrella. So we do not start from the climate justice fight. We have many uh, grassroots movements and activists that are on territories that uh, share with us their struggles and we share with them also the different facets. Um, so in general, we define two axes for our work. On the one hand, we say that we definitely work for the right to move uh, and therefore also support the um, different um, stages of that movement, be it within uh, African countries, on migration routes, on external externalized borders uh, in the Maghreb region or here in Europe with the precarization of migrant lives. But also we find it very important to um, support the right to stay and to have a self, uh, to a dignified and self-determined life. And this is where our struggles actually in both axes where we are confronted with the climate justice, um, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought in the chat it was for me for not hearing, but it's fine. Um, so um, the this is where for us climate justice fights and struggles are an immediate result to what uh, to the all the other struggles that we have be it when we analyze the reasons for certain crises or certain inequalities that we are seeing or also through the practical realities of our activists that are involved in our network so this is an immediate result it is something that we address uh, definitely so it is not a starting point or basically we don't label it that way but it is definitely present and very important in our struggles um and um, throughout the years, we've been doing a lot of action. It's been 10 years in different territories, but I wanted to mention just one example of action that, um, in my opinion, showcases a lot the connection of this um, um, anti-colonial struggle and the climate struggle. And basically, it's something that we found it always very easy to find those links because um, the oppressive institutions always have either their roots in colonial history, it's structures that started in colonial period and by the colonial uh, authorities, 
or they uh, are neocolonial continuities of that that are very visible. So for us, it was always easy to find that link and work on it and work based on it. Um, uh, okay, a bit slower. Um, and the one example that I wanted to talk about is our work with the grassroots um, um, organization or peasant union that is in Mali in the region of Office du Niger. Um, so, and for this to be a bit more specific, I would like to label it a struggle against land grabbing or against extractivism uh, that is facing small scale farmers or small farmers. Um, which are very important to the agricultural production overall. They account for 80% of the overall um, overall production and um, global supply chain, so to say. Um, we uh, start, uh, just to give a bit of context, for example, the Office du Niger is a colonial institution. It has been instated by uh, the uh, French authorities during the colonial period to be able to extract or to plant cotton to um, supply the French textile industry. So um, it is an institution that was called for uh, in the colonial times and it has remained and it is becoming the oppressive uh, instance that all the grassroots activists and farmers are fighting against because of their capitalist extractivist logics that always helps or um, that is always in the sense of uh, colonial powers or imperialist powers. And um, this is basically the historic content. The collective that we work with, which is called Coupon, which is a peasant union, started in 2013, um, around 2013 and 2014. Um, and it was in response to a German development project that caused the inhabitants, all the inhabitants of four villages to be displaced um, with the hope of uh, getting back to their land and uh, which did not happen. So they lost their land because they had the hope of agricultural development, so to say. And this is why um, the coupon was created and um, we then joined their struggles and made sure that we uh, connect those struggles and that we had a lot of protests happening in Mali, but also in Germany. And we did a lot of actions, a lot of open letters and knowledge production about the issue to hold um, the development agencies accountable. Um, and we had also a success that in 2014, the uh, peasants also got what they demanded for, but the struggle is ongoing because the repression by the Office du Niger is still ongoing and uh, in uh, lo the logistics and in micro land grabbing that is happening. Um, and what we noticed how this transnational work how the success of this transnational work is that it gave strength to this local um, to this local movement or this local collective grassroots um, collective, and made sure that they have their weight, such that uh, in a sort of a preventative way uh, they would be um, call, like they would be uh, recognized or they would be uh, called for when there is um, um, attempts to do some land, land grabbing and uh, to um, um, so this is like one example I wanted to point out um, and other stuff that we have been doing is a lot of this uh, pushing for the discourse on anti-colonial um, struggles so for us we see that also, like Kathy and Tina said, the connection and getting to connect with other collectives that have that we can build alliances with. Uh, we've been participating in many uh, events and activities to bring the anti-colonial aspect of the of the struggles. And um, we've been also doing a lot of this knowledge production in that we create this alternative media and this alternative ways of informing about the struggles happening um, um, on the ground. Um, so I wanted also to, to talk about like how, what are the problem or what kind of challenges arise when we have this type of transnational work, um, just in, in, um, in the perspective that we will be discussing today, tools and methods, how we can uh, build upon that. So what we have seen from um, uh, Africa Europe Interact is that, of course, there are different realities and how to connect these realities, like um, how can we um, find common ground to build, to find common ways of organizing. 
And um, through that, you have always different positionalities. You have, um, of course, South-North relations, which are not to be ignored. You have urban and rural. You have people with the jargon and the, the words to describe their struggles and people that do not, and they live it more in practice. So this is something that we find as um, a challenge to this transnational perspective and how we can so shift the focus to anti-colonial struggles is always to consider these positionalities and the power dynamics. And um, the opportunities are, however, that a, a very solid solidarity is built. It is very, uh, it is steady and it can uh, bring um, a lot of successes and build this concrete utopia for social and climate justice. Um, it is also when you work with these grassroots um, organizations, you have a lot of rootedness and reality um, reality checks that, okay, you can um, have your demands based on um, many ideals, but how do you concretely implement that when this is something that is um, affecting um, uh, certain um, territories more than others? And also uh, how we can, um, it is of course interacting with many, many other aspects when climate change um, uh, effects like droughts and floods are happening now and uh, on the spot. So how do you go with that and have your uh, reality or like the boundedness to this uh, reality? Um, from our experience in Africa Europe and Turkey, we see that it is very um, um, important to involve this um, a struggle for land, the struggle against extractivism in a sense that we connect to existing grassroots movements um, and we find that easiest when it comes to agricultural struggles, because these are struggles that have shown that they build very quickly and um, uh, built quickly, they unionize very quickly. You have a lot of these um, collectives on the spot and they are working, they are doing tremendous work. So how to approach the fight for climate justice is to support these grassroots activists and um, be there for their struggle and connect this to the agricultural revolution. And as I saw, this would be also a point for today. And um, it is also important to not start from a more of a deficitary view that there aren't enough um, movements happening because there are always a lot of um, possibilities and a lot of alliances that can be built. And um, also, once you connect for from IE, for, uh, at least we see that if you connect this agricultural struggle, you have immediately the transnational aspect of it because you have these small scale farmers, which are the majority in the production and in the weight, of, uh, like in the um, supply chains, global supply chains, which also can be uh, criticized, of course, but there you have immediately the uh, thing that unites everyone, which is the transnational um, large-scale uh, agro-industrial complexes and so on. Um, how we also work is also to be always uh, equally um, informed. So we have our activists always being informed about the climate justice struggles in Germany. And it is only fair to, to see that it has to be the other way around. Um, many of us in the IE network, we always um, have demands for a climate justice movement uh, happening in Germany that we see are in the same sense and have the same values. So we are also always challenging each other and challenging the movements to um, build upon that. Um, I have a lot of other points, but maybe due to time, I will just uh, leave it there and I'm very happy to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Nesrin. It was a, a wonderful presentation. And I believe that now we are having like more ideas about different things that are happening and how organizations are dealing with anti-colonial struggles, as Katie said, like echoing and connection with people with frontline fighters. Uh, as Tina said, like getting to know our enemy and also doing actions uh, regarding about different colleagues that are connected in the different parts of the world and know uh, what uh, it's needed for to support those struggles. And as Nesrin said, that maybe we can create alternative knowledge, alternative media, create networks to push anti-colonial uh, narratives here in Germany, uh, also while producing actions to support uh, grassroots that are uh, fighting in the front line and also help them with creating different connections uh, to create a stronger anti-colonial 
movement and also to uh, see how this anti-colonial perspective is one that allows us to have like a like a global uh, uh, to create global alternatives and as, uh, as Nesrin said to also bring the utopia to the climate justice movement so now we will move with our last input then we will go into breakout rooms uh, just to start a short discussion but we will talk about that later so now Luis from Indiclinda um, the floor is yours Thank you. Maybe first to check, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for all those very powerful inputs. <laughs> it was really great to listen to all of that. And I think it makes a lot of sense to talk about uh, anti-colonial activism in the different aspects that all of you have pointed out. And the narrative, what and whose story are you telling, and the demands, what demands are you formulating, and also in the organizing, so who are you working with? Maybe I will just briefly say something about the organ organizational part, um, because something that I, I got the impression, not only from Ende Gelände, but from a lot of uh, European um, organizing movements, is that frontline, frontline fighters, most affected people from most affected area, people from the global south, are usually invited at the beginning of the alliances, at the beginning of the meetings, to tell the story about what is going on, how fucked up the world is, how badly the situations are, but very rarely into the heart of the discussions about what we need to do and in strategy debates, um, so that actually movements from the global north can do what the global south needs, basically. And this is something that I and we think need definitely needs to change, um, and let's start with it today which is why I'm going to pass the mic to someone who is also part of Ende Gelände and who has helped a lot, uh, have helped Ende Gelände a lot to organize internationally and to someone who's actually, who actually knows what it means to organize anti in an anti-colonial way uh, and what it means to speak from a frontline perspective and uh, who has some very important things to share with you. So I just pass on the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. Hi, everyone. My name is Esteban. I'm from Argentina. I come from the front lines of Vaca Muerta, fighting fracking, and I actually had to leave my country for fighting some of your companies from Europe. Um, what I want to share with you is something very simple, very concrete, which is what we have been doing with Ende Gelende over the last couple of years. We've been building international anti-colonial coalitions against gas and fracking with more than 20 countries from Africa, Latin America, North America, and Europe. And we have been doing, the, this past summer, we did the biggest action in world history against gas and fracking. Uh, I know you must know that gas is becoming the new coal. As, uh, as coal, everyone agrees that must be left behind. And the situation with Ukraine is only going to lead to a lot more fracking and gas expansion on the other side of the world in the Americas for the people in Colombia, in Argentina, in Mexico, and the, the front lines within the U.S., like indigenous territories that we're also working with. So um, it seems to me that this is really important to bring to the table because these alliances need to expand, and we're already working on them. We're not talking the talk. We are walking the walk. We are the Global South pushing these campaigns forward, and Ende Gelende is putting itself at the service of it, Extinction Rebellion as well. It would be great if we could also connect with Fridays for Future, so when we do a global action later this year against gas, fracking, and colonialism, we could all really come together. But I also have to say, in regards of being anti-colonial, you know, earlier this year we did a global coastline rebellion because of the Repsol oil spill in Peru, we organized that with two weeks of time. As we were organizing, the spills happen also in Nigeria, in Ecuador, in Thailand. The Global North has nothing to say or nothing to do while Ende Gelende, XR, Fridays are planning months ahead. The, the earth is burning today. The climate crisis is happening today, and we are the front lines of that. So I want to say a word of suggestion that we should have a group, there is a group made up of Fridays, XR and the Galente and many others that could actually be available to respond to these kinds of emergencies to mobilize the global north on time because these are actually things that we can win. We can make Repsol pay. We can make Repsol get the fuck out of, of Peru if we want to, if we all come together. But for that we need to come together. 
And lastly, but not least, I come from the front lines of Vaca Muerta. And I must also tell you that in terms of being anti-colonial, we really need to watch out for the role of global NGOs. Global NGOs are playing a major negative role in colonizing the Global South, including 350.org, I'm sorry to say. I was really surprised and shocked to hear now and yesterday as well to see what a huge role it has, how much a space has been given to an NGO like 350, which in Vaca Muerta is actually completely discredited and despised because of its corruption, because they have been defrauded activists, including ourselves and other people in Vaca Muerta. And then they come to Europe to say that they are championing Vaca Muerta. Yeah, WWF as well is militarizing half of Africa in the name of conservation. With 350, I have actually denounced this publicly a couple months ago, and they have fired people because of this. And I, I'm not just attacking 350. I have been working with them over the last couple of months with their leadership in the U.S. to conduct an investigation that has resulted in them admitting that they fired the Latin American directors late recently and also committed to firing the Argentina national coordinator. So it's really shocking and really insulting for me as a frontliner who has been affected by them. And I have nothing against Tina here, who I don't know. And I have nothing against Katia, who I consider a friend. But I know that yesterday they talked about Vaca Muerta. Today they talked about Vaca Muerta. But this meeting has left out a lot of the proposals that were actually going to talk from the front lines. And I would really like to ask, for the organization of this meeting, that it should be a lot more transparent and that we, from the front lines, should be given a space in the organization of this strategic meeting to discuss the strategies for the German climate movement. And lastly, but not least, you know, don't buy the package. I know for Europe it's really easy to buy the package because I'm Argentinian, because Santiago is Argentinian. You just think that we are frontliners just because we're from the Global South. That's not the case. You need to connect to the true front lines. People from the metropolis usually are quite disconnected from that. So Europe, don't buy the EC package. The climate fight is full of fraud, is full of impersonators, is full of interest and NGOs that are trying to make money out of the climate crisis. And, you know, NGOs have a role to play in all of this and a good role to play. But we, the decision making of the climate movement should be made by the grassroots and the front lines. So it's really appalling to me to see how much space is being given to NGOs like 350, which is doing so much damage. And although they have committed now to rectifying that, they have not even made it public what the corruption was about. I have evidence on all of this, and I would like to share with all of you my phone number and my email address in case anyone needs any more evidence from what all I'm saying. But basically, I don't want to go uh, all about this negative stuff, but this is all part of the debate that the climate movement needs to have if we are going to get anywhere beyond words and, and impersonations. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban, uh, very much for uh, that input. Um, I believe that uh, it's uh, it's important to have all of these perspectives. Uh, I believe that they are very valuable, and I believe that it uh, that it is also very important now that we are having uh, the the discussion. Now that we are going to move into the breakout rooms, uh, to have the discussion about the roles that each actor can play. How can we connect with frontliners? How can we better? Um, how can we better create what is the role that we can play here uh, in Germany? What role do we need to play? How can, do we need to connect with the people from the front line? How can we organize and create bigger movements here? As you said, we need to create like the most important, um, the most important climate organizations here as in the Galende, Fridays for Future, uh, and as they organize very speedily during the Oceanaso, uh, we believe that that's a, a role that it's very important. And also how can we make them more permanent? How can we make them bigger? And how can we make them, um, and how well can we make it more consistent and for better usage, both for frontliners and both for struggles that are happening everywhere. And as you said, 
things here with the Ukraine situation will get uh, worse. So we need to be prepared for that and we need to be always in the verge of it. Uh, so the idea now, it would be to both, uh, yeah, NGOs, frontliners, and people uh, organizing here. So now the idea will be just to move into different, um, into breakout rooms uh, where we can have this discussion uh, about what is the role that the German climate justice movement uh, should play and can play in order to counter and be civilized these colonial dynamics. Uh, how can the perspective tools and strategies that were presented by Kathy, Esteban, Tina and Nasrin are helpful in order to proceed with that? And also, how can we mobilize more people and make these mobilizations as the ones that have been happening or the ones that are going to be planned for the next, for the year? How can we engage more people and not only the niche of the climate movement, but how can we also uh, arrive to people that are beyond the scope of the usual activists that are present there. Um, so yeah, the idea now is to go to the group environment. You can just click in the group environment and then from there you will be able to choose a small group. Uh, yeah. And we are gonna have half an hour for this. Uh, in this half an hour, we planned like the debate rooms, uh, to be there for like 20 minutes. So if you want to take like a 10 minute, uh, break afterwards and let's join here at a, at a quarter past 11, that should be fine. Um, so yes, uh, that's how we will follow and see you everyone in 30 minutes. Hello, Santi. Shall we work on my audio? Can you hear me actually? Yeah, you can stay here and we will... Uh... And in that respect, um, I think events like this are not enough to really sort out what do we, how do we understand climate justice and how do we actually move forward, build, build alliances and solidarity. That's why um, Louis' uh, suggestion is for me a great start to really come together and talk more uh, kind of uh, longer and, and deeper so that we could actually look into those points that we all agree. Um, not necessarily that we agree on all points, but at least if we see some points that we all agree, then that would be a good start. And specifically um, here, we also have this uh, need to actually specifically know which institutions are actually supporting, for example, extractivist um, projects in the Philippines. And Luis and Esteban already said a lot of those things that actually for me, we need it back in the Philippines so that we will be able to kind of name who are these, which institutions are these, and in fact, when we kind of organize the locals, like the German population and all other international people who are here, we could say, here is the institution, here is what we should expose, here is the um, institution that are ac actually having blood in their hands, and somehow we put a specific picture, what is actually the picture or the, the reality in the ground in the global south. People are dying, people are being displaced, they have uncertain future, and all of these things can become a clearer picture that there is something that has there is something to be done, and these institutions are to be held accountable. And I think that's the only way we can strengthen our understanding what is really happening in the ground, who are accountable, and what we could do in order to expose them, to hold them accountable, and to stop them um, in destroying the the global south more and more. For us, it's very important to always amplify the calls that's happening in our home front, uh, the Philippines, because this is the only way that people here can, can understand what's really happening. Because for them, they have a very comfortable life here. Like the normal middle class German citizen 
have a very comfortable life here. And for them, it's very, very hard to, to really look into, there's crisis and, and, and there's violence happening every day in the global south. And there's, there are the things that we have to address. Yeah, so I, I think this is just the start. And thank you for initiating this uh, We change. It's very good that we get to see each other, not face to face, but at least online. And I hope we could really get uh, deeper into this, into dialogues, into discussions, and even into the debates. And then we could further um, strengthen our unity through these debates, hopefully. We really uh, look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, uh, Esteban and Luis, you wanted to comment something on this question. Thank you, Santiago. Kathy, I uh, completely agree with you. And we also must say that Philippines and Colombia have the highest murder rates in the world for environmental defenders. Our comrades fighting fracking in Colombia, they just had two of their fellow activists assassinated by paramilitary groups. One more of them has had to run into exile. She's currently in France. This is the realities of people, and needless to say with the Philippines, like Duterte murdered nine activists in one weekend a few months ago. So the, the risks that activism involves in the front lines of the global south are unparalleled, and these are the people that are defending the planet. So I think it's also a great opportunity for Europe to ground itself for the climate movements to not only talk about abstract demands such as tell the truth, five for 1.5, uh, people over profit. These things everyone can agree with, but they are abstract. Keep those abstract demands, but also get some concrete demands. Get Repsol to pay for the spill in Peru. It's a fucking ecocide. 20 beaches contaminated, marine life driven to the brink of extinction, Tens of thousands of people unable to fish and eat and live. And the Philippines is a similar situation. So, and it's your companies, often it's the, the multinational companies from Europe, Shell, Total, BP, Equinor, uh, Wintersal, Monsanto. So what is the climate movement doing in Europe that is not responding to these emergencies, which are your responsibility to respond? So it's great to talk about December, September, August, but also, Let's create a, a force that has the empathy and the capacity to respond when there is a problem in the Philippines or in Colombia, because those people are at the front lines of the climate crisis, and sooner or later that's going to come here in one way or another. Yes, um, I think that it's also important uh, to focus these emergencies that they are uh, that we need to respond, but also we need to, to respond as well. I think that it's something that it's also a debate about climate reparations, uh, about the emergencies, about the things that are happening, about the oil spillages, about land grabbing. And also in order, we need to talk about the wider financial movement because we also have this debate about, uh, for example, uh, Esteban, you must be also familiar, like in Argentina, this uh, debate that's happening about extractivism is the only way to develop um, and we also need need to put that uh, that into to help our frontliners in order uh, to help them overcome that because it's it's the government saying or we are going to remain poor for the rest of our lives or we start using extractivism to gain money in order to get people out of poverty when the reality is that that uh, money goes to paying debt that we have with you no know, global north institutions and countries and also uh, they are sent back by the companies to their home to their mother uh, headquarters so this is something also very important we need to have these two things and there is also uh, another uh, question that arises here and it's sort of how to combine this uh, spontaneous mobilizations in the global north around these concrete projects in the global south and the long-term system change uh, some people, uh, so it's how can we have these two things in mind? And I don't know if someone from the panel would like to comment on that. Uh, I think that it's also something that it's very important um, because I think that sometimes here they lose the perspective or, or it's just solidarity or it's just system change uh, when they are, when they actually are things that go together because we need to address the, something that as Esteban said, 
these things will come here to Europe and will attack you here in Europe. And that is why here in Europe there is uh, sometimes a narrative about the future, but we need to talk about the present because climate change is a reality in most of the world. So I don't know if someone would like to to talk about how to have those two things in mind uh, whenever uh, talking about the long-term strategy and also with doing spontaneous actions to be civilized this. Um, so I would ask someone from the panel would like to comment on this. There is just one question also now. Lisa says that she would like not to speak of our companies because I think it separates us as a global population. Yes, it is absolutely true that it's European and US companies exploiting Southern companies and that in Northern countries we profit from it, but I refuse to identify with them. Um, I do not vote for them. I do not agree with their practices and I'd much rather see us as a global population in mutual struggle against those capitalist companies. Uh, so I'd much rather raise a mutual conscious of us together. So I don't know if someone would also like to comment on those two questions that arise. No? Kathy? No, I, I would like to comment into that. Lisa, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I think it's very important to really um, emphasize that, that we are not against the people of any country because they themselves are also being exploited and also carry the brunt of um, all those interests that their um, companies are doing in in the global south. Um, that's why I'm always saying that um, it's not about the, the uh, conflict or the contradiction between the peoples in between countries, but it's actually the contradiction between those uh, companies that exploit and extract those resources in the global south. And um, we in the Philippines, as you have said, Esteban Duterte is the symbol of exploitative um, transnational or multinational companies. They're at, those fascist regimes are actually those um, that pave the ground for all of these international transnational companies to be able to encroach to aggressive and to aggressively um, um, go inside those communities that we so dearly protect, and and so um, Lisa, thank you for pointing that out. And we we know that there's a very much potential in reaching out to people who um, not necessarily identify themselves as just because we live in Germany, we are exploiting other people. It, it, it's you know it's uh, it's like we live here. Of course, we have the responsibility to unite with those more, more exploited in the global south. And there's a very huge potential to forge that unity rather than to kind of um, make um, one one nationality again against the other. I don't know if I, I clearly stated it. But uh, I think those are actually one of those avenues that we can look into and to, um, to, to kind of strengthen and widen our unity rather than to come into or hit a wall of saying, OK, um, we have very we have strongly contradicting in interests and there's no way to, to unite. So this is just one of those examples of now um, there are some debates or con conflicts that are cropping up, but I hope we can really work together in, into sorting this out and find those things that really unite us. Because in the end, this is the world. We only have one planet. I, I would also like to go into those things that um, in, in the end, we, we have to really um, strengthen our unity. I don't know if, yes, uh, Luis, uh, Nesrin first, that she, she has been talking this round, and then Esteban Luis. Um, thank you for pushing me forward. Uh, I wanted to say, like, on possible actions, uh, there, was a, there was a question of what possible actions can be. Um, this might seem repetitive, but um, I also feel that these kind of an, events are not enough. In my experience, it has been always a start like this, but the momentum is not used and it's not 
pushed on forward. And I gave in one of the breakout rooms the example where I, I felt like the mobilization of the climate just the climate movements or climate justice movements in Germany were not enough, where there was an, a, a, an action done with the Chico Mendes um, collective uh, against the um, extractivist um, strategies of the Deutsche Bahn, for example, where there weren't enough people. So one of the actions to do there is to be informed about what kind of um, what kind of connections there are of this transnational struggle and to be there when they are um, calling for protest or calling for people to join. Um, um, also repetitive, but building alliances. And I feel like to touch on the second questions of how to, to avoid dangers of maybe doing counterproductive things with spontaneous actions or long-term strategies. I don't, I don't, I, of course, there might be dangers that can occur, but these can be kept to a minimum of you, um, if you are always in connect or in contact with the grassroots movements and asking them what do they need right now, this is how you can avoid that. This is like in terms of saying a very time intensive communication has to be done. This is not something to be filled out with um, beautiful words or um, abstract ideas and ideals. Um, that often when you are implementing these things, you are faced with conflict. You are even sometimes faced with, uh, for example, in our case, if I would say we are active in Mali mostly, so um, there is now the the sanctions against Mali. And um, so there was this problem of climate uh, just, uh, injustice happening and then comes upon it many other things like war and securitarian problems and so on. So just hear out the people who are fighting, like leading these multiple fights and ask them what do they need, because usually they have very concrete ideas of what they need. They can tell you that. So um, in the sense of building alliances, like also was said by Luisa and Esteban, is not to have this ready packages and uh, something to be uh, beautifully um, said and so on. So this is uh, it. And I believe also that, uh, of course, um, whenever there are direct actions, um, one has to be involved and come to the to these um, to these uh, calls for solidarity. And um, for me, also the idea of how to phrase our companies or not, of course, um, the climate injustice is, is affecting more people also disproportionately also in the global north countries. Uh, it's also a question of phrasing or maybe just of discourse just to have this um, uh, shock effect or to have these people within. But I also agree that um, of course, these are the, the multinational companies that we have to fight against. Um, however, I do feel that there is some sort of, of, um, of something that has to be done, which is not only to acknowledge that there is this inequality between North and South, global North and global South, but to also like try to work, like, what do we do? Okay, so we acknowledge that there is this inequality, but now, and also like when you connect with grassroots activists from different countries, these inequalities or power dynamics or positionalities, they are there. So how do you work with that? How do you use those strengths strategically without discriminating further or, um, one thing that is always a problem is how, what methods uh, do you use, uh, even of communication within uh, a movement? So there's always this, um, so the narrative of our companies or like to distance yourself completely from the companies that, uh, of course, they are not something that you support, but sometimes there are these positionalities that do play into these ways of organizing that have to be uh, very careful with and have to uh, be kept it, like keep it in mind. And yes, um, connecting to the frontliners, they usually have really uh, direct um, uh, demands. And one thing I wanted to just say is that we should really, I feel this is again and again the case that it is assumed that there is a deficit of people, of migrants or people from the global south working and for climate justice. There is isn't, there is no deficit. There is a lot of people working and there, there is a lot of connections that can have, that can be made. And they even have more successes than us here. Like they are seeing, um, uh, of course, there's a lot of trauma and there is a lot of genocide and tragedy, but there is concrete, very successful things that we can build upon and a lot of uprisings that are happening that we will not see in Europe uh, anytime soon. Like if you think about also climate just in Sudan, for example, where there is anarchist uprisings. Um, 
in connection to these this insecurity but also you have the climate justice um movement present there and when one last thing and i'm sorry if i am talking too much but um to always um in as a direct transnational a move is to connect with migrants and people from the global south who are here already. They have this transnational narrative already because they know here and there and the different um, connections have them there. And um, even if they don't label this struggle as climate justice, you can really find that link very easily and also bring in the anti-colonial lens. So that's my, um, my, my uh, contribution. Thank you very much. Yeah, Esteban and Luis had the word. Yeah, thank you. As Rin just said, I think most of the most of the important things, uh, and especially to uh, come back to the the question of long term or or short term things. Uh, I think that a lot of people and a lot of movements here are very worried about contradictions. And I think we just have to acknowledge that these struggles are contradicting, uh, contradictive, and we have to learn how to live with contradictory stuff. And that's things that here from groups maybe appear to be contradictive, while it's not for other people. Like the contradictions or the, the fights that we are having, that we are fighting here, like Ender Glenda bashing on Fridays for Future or Extinction Rebellion and vice versa, these things don't matter if you come together for people who are actually uh, suffering the consequences of what is going on. Um, and so I think this is also a, 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 an, a, what do you call that, like a, an exercise for people here, just like deal with contradictions. It's okay if it's not the perfect movement. It's okay if uh, afterwards there's a backlash from whoever is then going to criticize. Of course we're going to be criticized. We are tackling, we're tackling interests, like uh, global interests. And of course we have to deal with <laughs> the fact that there is going to be backlash and criticism from all of uh, all of the directions. And I think Lisa has pointed out something very important <clears throat> when she wrote, like, I didn't vote for these companies. This is exactly the problem. This is exactly what is happening. Corporations are replacing governments and state, states basically as sovereigns, which is, I mean, I'm not advocating for states and governments to be like sovereigns of regions, whatever. We can have an entire discussion on that. But it's a fact that we are having non-democratic uh, institutions, organizations ruling over territories that nobody voted to put there. And they, they are taking on um, responsibilities that usually should be the responsibilities of, of empowered people, like um, dealing on organizing our food production, organizing our energy distribution and production. This is some um, building schools, whatever you want to say. And this is something that is that is being used by corporations to greenwash or what you, would you call it, redwash them to be like socially responsible. Um, and the same with water. The, the same time they are <clears throat> they are contaminating the water and stealing water, privatizing water. They are also using water to to greenwash them to say we are building wells here for the local community. Blah blah blah. So I think to go not only just co corporations but corporate power to have the entanglement of finance, politics, economics, and civil society. Uh, as one of the goals is a, a great opportunity to bring also to bring in labor movements, right? Because for who who is who is working for the corporations? It's workers and all the the European uh, movements and the climate movements saying, oh, we need to connect to unions. Well, where do you, where do you think they are employed in corporate well, corporations? And we can all come together in that as well. That is pr probably not the best place to work. We are alienated from our labor and so on. So I think it's a great. Um, opportunity for everyone to be able to connect uh, our struggles for uh, better wages and self, um, how do you say that, self-governed uh, lives for everybody. No? And can I briefly add, we are organizing a global action for World Water Day on the 22nd of March. This is driven by the Global South. Water, believe it or not, has started to trade in Wall Street, okay? I know many people in Europe don't still don't know this after a year and a half. Water has become a commodity and is trading in Wall Street like gold and silver. And the, the companies and the financial markets, the centers of power are in Europe, are in the global north, and Europe is doing nothing about it. Argentina will mobilize thousands of people the 22nd of March. Much of Africa and the rest of Latin America, we're planning a huge global action and we're meeting every Friday to plan for it. So if you could join, if you want to support it, it would be great. We're also trying to see if Fridays for Future International, because they are doing a demo on the 25th, if they could actually talk about this issue, because the biggest part of the climate crisis is the water crisis. 
and billions of refugees, climate refugees, will come to Europe in the coming decades because people are running out of water. That means they're running out of food. They're running out of land that they can cultivate. So it's really important that Europe actually begins to think of water, even if it's not an immediate problem for the north of Europe that has a lot of it. We can share the call info here now. Thank you very much, Esteban. That'd be great. So we are a little bit out of out of time, but we can stretch it a couple more minutes. So I would ask if anyone from the panel would like to share some final thoughts or say something or comment on something. Um, just a, a last round, if you would like. If not, we can move on to close it so people can have a break before the next uh, before the next uh, session. So I don't know if someone would like to have some last common thoughts on the panel. No? <clears throat> I see someone's typing. Yeah, so just to do a short recap of things that were said, very concrete things. On the 22nd of March, we will have the World Water Action Day. Uh, people are meeting on Fridays in order to activate, in order to see what actions will take place and how they will take place. Everyone has Louis's number that she had just uh, put it down, wrote it down, uh, in order for people who would like to join the Spontaneous Action Group on Signal. Uh, so that are very concrete and nice things that came up from here. Um, and then maybe we can move to the closing. Yeah, it's 6 p.m. German time. It's uh, online or it's uh, uh, it's online, offline or online so it's online and if people would like to connect there they can just write to you Luis and you can share the link with them that'd be fine okay so if anyone would like to join uh, the World Water Action Day you can do it. it you can write to Luis it's on Fridays at 6 p.m. German time and then I think that there are very important things that were said here I think that one of the most important is to do these connections about that we need to do things here. Uh, one dimension that we can talk about, it's about like representativeness. We have people in the global south who do not have action to do actions or to uh, give a fight where people that are actually deciding their lives because beyond that they can pressure their government into taking action. Uh, yes, Luis Esteban, you would like to say something before, yeah. Thank you, Santiago. Sorry, one thing that I wanted no, no. to mention again is that, um, that for the for the next ACON meeting, I think there's one in the summer, right? If we could ask for a little more transparency and to give a role to frontliners and not necessarily so much space for NGOs. NGOs can play a great role, but I think the strategies should be set from the front lines. And then NGOs can definitely support that. Let's not confuse the roles of who is uh, pushing forward the climate fight here. Thank you very much, Esteban. I think it's it's very important uh, to know that this in in this movement ecosystem to know who are the actors and to know the role that each each actor can play and how they can play this role in, in a better way in order to move the fight forward and to enact actual system change. Uh, that it is what we need to end climate justice. And I think that going back to that, I think that it's also very important. We had here in this meeting people that are connected to Latin America, to Southeast Asia, to Africa, to different parts of the world who are connected to fighters in the front line. So we need to think maybe here in Germany how we can create a more fluid and, 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 and a better, uh, a better uh, sh share better what each what's happening in our territories in order because we know that maybe in each of the territories the fights can have a different uh, can look differently they can be targeting a different uh, mat raw material but we know that everything that's behind this it's colonialism neo-colonialism it's the entitlement about politics finances so we need to know how to better um, we need to know how to better interact, how to be more prepared. And as we said, we had these two different dimensions that are really actually one, but these two different types of actions that can be about the most spontaneous actions that we need to do and also having in the in the wider in, in the 
in the longer run also to achieve system change. So we need, in order, we need all of the actors working together uh, to create massive mobilizations in order to put pressure, in order to echo what it's being uh, the demands of the global south and the demands of the people that are in the front line. So we really need to create those spaces of exchange. We know that a conference is not enough. It's uh, just one point, and we really need to create this this parallel ongoing structures and spaces of exchange amongst each other in order to be able to, whenever there's a conference, to put it down in order for this to be a, a place where we can set it more publicly and in order to gain more people in our fights. But we also need to create the structures on a daily, that will be on a daily basis, creating the numbers and also creating this communication, this alternative media, getting to know better the enemy of what what we need to fight to organize the actions uh, in order to achieve system change. Because as we already said, we know that colonialism is one of the pillars of the current capitalistic system and we need anti-colonial perspective and actions and narratives in order to enact uh, system change. So thank you very much everyone who's participated here. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, panel. I think lots of ideas, also concrete things happen. So thank you very much and see you on the streets. <laughs>